Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Jay and welcome to the channel and welcome back to October Lake and Planet Zoo, a project where we're working on creating this really large park situated in the Canadian Highlands. If that does sound good to you, please do consider giving the video a like if you did like the video today. And of course, do subscribe for Planet Zoo content. I do upload every Wednesday at 5 p.m. UK time. Now, let's talk about today's episode. In today's episode, we are going to be building a habitat for a relatively large colony of Japanese macaques, also known as snow monkeys. These guys are one of my favorite animals in the game, actually. For any of you who've been around the channel since, like, well, since the start back, like, in, like, November 2019 or something, um, you will know that I actually really, really like these animals. They featured in my top 10 Planet Zoo animals. I can't remember what position they got, but... They are amazing little creatures. I love them. I think they're just so cute and so interesting as animals. So I'm very glad to have the chance to like build a nice big habitat for them because I haven't actually built one in game for them on the channel at least. So it's nice to be able to do that, especially considering how interesting they are. And um, this habitat is definitely one of my favorite ones that I've built so far. It is quite different from all my other habitats, I think. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, first off, this one is not necessarily one habitat, but it's two... Well, it's one main habitat and a second smaller habitat connected by like this kind of uh, above ground walkway which the monkeys can walk through. So that's going to be quite a cool little challenge to do. I'm surprised how... Um, I wouldn't say easy, but I, I'm surprised how like effectively it works. I was a little bit worried with the traversable area and all that, that the monkeys wouldn't be able to actually cross over. But they do, and it works pretty well, so I'm very happy with how that all turned out. As you can see on screen, what we're first doing is working on the main habitat itself. Here what I'm doing is just kind of outlining the different elevations I wanted. So I wanted that to be a relatively low fence for the guests to look at the monkeys through, so for that to work, we needed to lower most of the habitat. I also wanted a decent amount of water in this habitat so that I could have some waterfalls. And the reason I wanted this is to kind of harken back to that idea of... So if you know anything about the, um, the Japanese macaques, the snow monkeys, you know that in uh, some of the wildlife like nature reserves and parks where they live in Japan, uh, they've taken up sitting in hot springs to kind of warm up from the cold, which is so cute. And it's just, it's one of the coolest things that they do. It's a learned behavior. They learned that from watching people sit in the hot springs to warm up. And um, not all of the Japanese macaques do that, of course. Not all of them across the whole of Japan. But a few populations in these parks with hot springs have like learned that behavior from watching people and now just spend like their daytime hanging out in hot springs. So to kind of like harken back to that idea, I decided to include some waterfalls here. Just very shallow water, like stuff where the, if a monkey were to fall in there, they wouldn't have any issue. But even if they did, it shouldn't be a problem because Japanese macaques are actually really good swimmers. In fact, in the wild, they've been sw uh, seen swimming up to half a kilometer easily. Um, they, they've been known to swim quite long distances, so I do not worry about them like falling into the water or anything here, especially considering it is pretty shallow. That is not true for all primates. There are a lot of primates which do enjoy swimming, but for the most part, a lot of them will avoid water for the most part, so it really depends on the species. If you go to a zoo, you'll most likely see, like, if you go to a primate habitat, there's a good chance it will be a dry moat as opposed to a water-filled one, so uh, it really depends on the species. But for the most part, these guys really enjoy spending time in the water, so I was very, very happy to include a little bit of water area for them. And of course, using lots of the faux rock pieces, as you can see on screen, to uh, kind of bring in that idea that this is an artificial water feature, not something that was there already. And blending it in with the, the natural rocks as well, and I think it looks really nice. So while we're working on the habitat itself, and today is going to be a bit of a longer video than the past few October Lake ones, so do you settle in a little bit because uh, it will be a bit longer, get comfy, uh, grab yourself a snack if you like. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the Japanese macaques themselves. These guys are just absolutely adorable animals. I think they're so cool. They've got this beautiful uh, whitish kind of gray fur that can have like brownish specks on them. And they've got these bright pink uh, faces and butts. <laughs> and they've got a very short tail. 
and they were, um, they're just really cool. So they exist on like three of the four uh, islands of Japan, uh, the three lower ones, I believe. So that is, um, that kind of makes them the most northern ranging primate of, out of all of them, with the exception of us humans, of course. But they live in the coldest temperature, the furthest north, out of any primate, which is really interesting. And that means these guys have to cope with temperatures of up to like negative 20 degrees Celsius, or um, if you, uh, the Americans watching, that's negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's really quite insane for a primate to have to cope with that. No other primate has been able to cope with that, with the exception of us humans. And that's only because we wear clothes and stuff. Without that, we wouldn't be able to do that either. So. That's massively impressive on the part of the primates here. Before I continue talking about them, just on screen what we're doing now and what we're going to be doing for a few more minutes is working on the climbing structures. And I wanted the climbing structures to kind of circle most of the habitat so that if they wanted to, they don't actually have to get onto the ground at any point. I think the climbing structures turned out pretty good. There's quite a lot of them. And um, I think they're, they're quite possibly my favorite climbing structures that I've ever done. I'm not the best at climbing structures, so I'm not, like, generally speaking, I don't usually do them very well, so today's, I'm, I'm really happy with how this turned out. Anyways, going back to the macaques themselves, um, they are kind of group animals, of course, if you've ever seen videos or documentaries of them, you'll see them in big, big colonies, and that's why in this uh, episode we will be introducing I think something like 30 of them if I'm not mistaken, so another very large habitat. So the last one we did was the penguins, where we had like 60 of them in the habitat. This one is another big one, we have I think about 30. It's nice to see them all in a big group like that. And of course, uh, being primates like this, they are very big on like familial relations. They are extremely social animals, they groom each other, they feed each other, they take care of each other very closely, and in fact, um, parenting is very important for these animals as well and a lot of the time um, multiple individual macaques will take care of uh, each other's babies so that's really quite cool sometimes there are females which have never had babies and they will take care of other females babies it's really quite cool and quite rarely in primates in this in this specific species um, the males actually take care of the infants as well which is quite cool and um, it's just really interesting to see. I love seeing uh, primates like this. One of my favorite zoo habitats of all time is the Hamadreus baboon habitat in Singapore Zoo. And I love watching them because you get such a good look at their social structures and how they really take care of each other. It's really beautiful to watch and I think it really, it really shows you how closely related we are to these animals. Like when you look at a primate like this you, and you look at how they behave, you look at their faces, you look at how they are you can really tell like these are not that far away from us they're incredibly similar and that's quite incredible back to these guys they're also very intelligent speaking of which um, they know how to clean food so they've been seen like washing their food before they eat it and of course like I mentioned earlier with the hot springs they learn behaviors so when they watch people uh, hanging out in the hot springs to get warm in the cold temperatures, they realize they could do that too, so they've started doing that. And of course, because they've done that, they've become a bit of a tourist attraction, which is quite good in the sense that now their populations are protected quite significantly. So if you go to some of these um, uh, nature parks, I believe uh, the most northern one is called Jigokudani Monkey Park, um, and that is the most northern northern of these uh, wildlife parks for the monkeys at present and you have plenty of these hot springs and this is where the monkeys generally hang out and because they've become such a tourist attraction the park rangers take care of them they feed them and generally speaking their population is very very protected so overall the species is considered least concern on the IUCN red list which means they are absolutely fine and generally speaking their population is not threatened very much they are just generally really cool and like, oh, by the way, just the amount of times you say the word generally, it's just it's not great, but um, they are very cool. And I like the fact that the, uh, they are just such a unique primate. If the, just a little fun fact as well. Apparently back in the 70s, a bunch of researchers decided to randomly translocate a bunch of these primates to Texas of all places. 
to see if they would survive. And uh, first off, that doesn't sound like an ethical experiment in any way. That sounds kind of horrendous. But apparently the primates, th these Japanese macaques, ended up like thriving. Not at first, apparently they did struggle at first, but after a while they just learned how to live there. They learned how to avoid the natural predators there, they learned how to find food. Like, first off, completely not saying that was a good experiment in any ways, it seemed entirely unethical and pointless. But it did, you know, it's kind of cool to see that these monkeys can survive and can adapt really well. So that's, that's very, very cool. One um, interesting thing as well is that they are quite prominently featured in Japanese folklore. So if you've ever heard of that whole concept of, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, that sort of thing, and you see the, the you know, the image of the monkeys closing their eyes, ears and mouth, that's actually based off these Japanese macaques because they are considered very wise animals and it is uh, quite an interesting bit of trivia there for you guys. Anyways, that's pretty much it for me talking about these uh, monkeys. They are really, really cool. Um, so cute. And I'm very, very happy to have um, made this habitat for them. And just a quick addition. If you want to see some uh, Japanese macaques live, I would suggest checking out the Highlands Wildlife Park website. So that's a wildlife park in Scotland. And they have a live camera um, always pointed at the uh, Japanese macaques. So you can see them hanging out. In fact, right before I recorded this, I went and checked them out. And they're just having the time of their lives, just running around in the cold and just, just enjoying each other's company, I guess. But yeah, it looked like they were having a good time. So if you want to see them live, go check out the Highlands Wildlife Park website. Now back to what's going on on screen. As you can see, we've started adding foliage here. I didn't want to have too many tall trees. You'll see me put in a few Douglas uh, firs and a couple of these white birches. But besides those, not an awful lot of foliage besides low-lying stuff because I wanted them to use mainly the climbing structures and not really the larger trees. Uh, with the stained wood here, I'm sticking to the kind of the similar aesthetic we've had for the previous few habitats in this area. So very similar to the, um, the red panda habitat, which, is, which this is right next to, by the way. In fact, with the two habitat structure of this, um, this habitat, the two, <laughs> you know what I mean. But with this structure, it's really interesting because it actually um, goes completely around the red pandas. So technically speaking, if you were in the red panda habitat, you could see the monkeys walking from one end of the habitat to the other end, which I think is really cool. And I'm really, really glad with how this turned out. I was very, very, um, very pleased. I was a little bit nervous at first with that idea because traversable area in this game can be very tricky to work with like sometimes you'll spend so much time working on a habitat and then realize your animals can barely like traverse any of it because um like hitboxes are too big or anything like that but in this case i worked out really well i'm very pleased with how it turned out and um it was just yeah it was so much more like reversible than I realized basically the monkeys can use almost all of it so I'm very happy with that. Here we are starting the work on the little uh, bridge slash tube slash walkway where the monkeys are going to be able to walk from one end to the other end. It's going to be a uh, glass walled and it's going to be built right into the side of this cliff here so it's gonna like you can essentially wa watch from a distance the monkeys walking through this. And because it passes right over the staff area, I'm going to add in a little entrance for the monkeys into the staff area so that if the staff needed to get hold of a monkey or something, like for, you know, veterinary research or if they needed to take care of one of the animals, for example, separate from the others, they could just uh, open up that specific door and then um, lure in one of the monkeys with some food or something. And that's how they would get them into the staff area. But they also have a separate door, of course. This is just like a additional things so this is what I'm doing here right now as you can see just adding in a bit of an extension and then I'll add in a bit of a ladder as well and that should be a relatively effective way I think of getting monkeys into the soft area I think I've seen something like this before in a zoo but I cannot remember for the life of me Anyways, uh, besides what we're doing on screen, I just also wanted to say Happy World Wildlife Day. That is apparently today and I did not realize, so that is 
pretty cool. Uh, so, you know, to celebrate, let's talk a little bit about uh, conservation and stuff like that. So World Wildlife Day was actually, I believe, started by the UN, which is interesting. I didn't know the UN had that much of a, a wildlife focus, so that's really cool. And it is interesting to see that nowadays, especially throughout the pandemic, people have become a lot more aware of conservation related issues. For example, like uh, back in the early days of the pandemic, when people were still thinking it was mostly pangolins that was responsible for the, well not responsible, but were the initial hosts of the virus and stuff. And people started talking a lot more about like, you know, bushmeat and the black market wildlife trade and stuff like that. It is all uh, fascinating stuff, but it's just, it's nice to see that people are becoming more aware of like the really serious issues that are out there. There's still a lot more work to be done. Like when it comes to wildlife issues, there's, you can never really talk about it enough because there's just so much going on. And when we're talking about thousands of species like this, it is, it is absolutely vital that we still keep the conversation going. And um, so to kind of commemorate this day, I would, you know, suggest maybe Talk to someone about wildlife. Talk to someone about the issues that you really care about. You know, share share something about your favorite animal. Stuff like that. It's always good to get that conversation going and to kind of talk to people about it. That's just it's just a good thing to do, I think. And um, I was going to say something else, but I've completely forgotten what it was. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's again. I've said this several times before, but because of this um this pandemic. A lot of zoos and wildlife parks are struggling at the moment and they do, you know, they provide such an important service in the sense that they have captive breeding programs, conservation research, so many important things for the longevity of so many species. So if you can do support your local zoo as well. Uh, for me, my local zoo is London Zoo and I also have like Battersea Children Zoo. And um, when this, when essentially once this lockdown ends, which is not that far away, thankfully thanks to vaccine and stuff i will be definitely heading back to the zoos and hopefully i'll make some videos for you guys as well um because they just really deserve our support especially the good ones and to be fair i would say only the good ones because if they're bad they really do not deserve our support but if they're good they absolutely do and um one more cool thing is that i've decided that i'm going to be doing my dissertation in my science communication uh, masters on zoos and talking about the the existence of nuance within zoos because sometimes when you look in the media people say that zoos are either all good or all bad when there's so much like gray area that there's so much detail and nuance that it's just missed out because we're talking about thousands of species each with individual care requirements and stuff like that so i'm going to do a dissertation looking into that whole issue and yeah it'll be pretty fun i'm quite excited for it it's nice to kind of blend to my own personal interest with the courses that I'm doing so very much looking forward to that. Anyways back on screen now we will have uh, mostly finished that uh, central walkway. We are now going to be working on the second smaller habitat area so that's just here where you can see uh, us starting to do some work on screen. So as you can see the structure of the habitat so if you're walking from where the tropical house is you go past the pangolin house and then on your left, you will see this uh, initial macaque habitat. And probably how it's gonna go is you'll probably see that a few macaques, maybe two or three, and you'll see them hanging around and you think, oh, that's a pretty cool little habitat, but it's not an awful lot. And you thought there'll be more. And then you look towards the back and you see the walkway and then you're like, oh, okay. And then you kind of walk towards it and then you keep going and you, maybe you go through the red panda habitat and then you go past and then you open up into this like really a beautiful vista where you can see all the macaques hanging out by the mountainside with the waterfalls and everything and I wanted that to be like quite like a, a wow moment so I'm very very happy with how that turned out I think it really does sell that idea of like this really beautiful area where these monkeys can just chill and have a good time and um, like I said we do have quite a lot of them and surprisingly enough um, they all seem to be happy with it like the habitat itself like like i said even without the traversable area um i was very surprised because it was quite coincidental i didn't look at the you know the proportion of soil and stuff usually but apparently they're very pleased the only thing they would like is snow and speaking of snow if you stick around to the cinematics i actually turned the snow on for once in the park so 
we do have a look at all these animals and just the park as a whole in the snow. So stick around for that. I think it looks beautiful. It looks really, really cool, especially when you see the snow um, stop falling and then start melting. It's just the atmosphere is incredible in the park. So if you stick around for that, you'll be, I think I managed to get some footage of uh, the penguins as well in the snow. So do check that out. I think um, they look so cute and it looks like they're really enjoying themselves. Like this is probably the first time I've ever taken footage of a park in the snow, like at all. So that's quite fun. Because I've been working in primarily tropical and temperate parks so far, so yeah. Speaking of which, um, I recently received a comment asking me if I'm going to go back to Sanikov land, my other park build at any point. And the answer is probably yes, um, maybe next month. I, I am really like keen on October Lake right now, so I'm kind of like riding that high, like trying to get this park done as much as I can because just it, I think it's like it's so much fun to build in it right now. Uh, but I do have ideas for Sanikov land. I am quite keen to get back into that as well. So probably next month. Um, there will be a lot of videos coming to this channel later in March because Prehistoric Kingdoms Alpha will be released and I will be 100% making quite a few videos on that. So look forward to that. Otherwise, uh, October Lake's going to continue as usual. We are, you know, it's not a big park. So, well, I say it's not a big park. I literally open every episode by saying it's a large park. It is a large park. So we will be working on quite a few more things. Uh, we have, of course, more cold weather animals to add. I'm thinking maybe the snow leopard next or the Formosan black bear. So those are going to be some pretty big habitats as well. And of course, can't forget the gray seal. We need to introduce that at some point because it's been several months since the aquatic pack released and I still haven't made a video about the gray seal. So we'll definitely have to do that at some point. In fact, considering the fact that the new DLC, like whatever it may be, will probably drop sometime next month, like because it is roughly around three months between DLCs or four months. So we'll probably get the next one sooner than later. So I want to get the Grey Seal done before we end up getting something new. I would be pretty excited for something new though. Like I wonder what it could be. Um, lots of people want an aviary pack like me too, of course. It would be cool to have birds. But I don't think we're getting anything quite like that yet. I'm still thinking we'd get another continent pack of some sort. And maybe an Asian pack or a North American pack would be pretty cool. Something like that. So yeah, that will be pretty fun. Anyways, we're pretty much here at the end of the episode now. I do hope you've enjoyed today's uh, video. I know it is a bit of a longer one than usual, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. I hope you enjoyed learning about the snow monkeys and how adorable they are and how cute they are. Um, yeah, do like the video if you did like it. Leave a comment down below if you have any suggestions for the park or if you have any suggestions for future videos. And um, yeah, subscribe for more Planet Zoo content. Like I said, 5 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. And as always, I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.